Hey, welcome to Just Shoot It, the podcast about filmmaking, screenwriting, and directing. This episode is brought to you by patrons Christopher Weil, Jason Apple, and Ben Donovan. I'm Matt Enlow. And I'm Warren Kaplan. And today we have on the writing, directing, acting duo, Selena Warren and Marissa Reed. They are awesome. Every once in a while, we have guests on that are just like, I think so funny and like into being on the podcast, which sounds funny because I, I think a lot of times it takes like 30 minutes to get people like, Warmed up and into it. Warmed, and like they, into it. Yeah. The bits were flying so hard. You um, were uh, admonishing me. Is that the right word? Yeah, I was annoyed for sure. I was like, Orin, I have real questions. Besides from being like really funny, really insightful filmmakers, they have a really fascinating story that I wanted to dig in on. And in spite of your obstruction, I think we got some really great details from them. Out of the gate, they were show running a show called Foursome that had four hit seasons on various iterations of youtube premium i think when it first started it was youtube red they realized that was a terrible brand name and so then they moved it to youtube originals and then youtube premium um it survived all of those uh and then they went on to have incredible careers selling things shooting things all over the place in really exciting ways and also are still out there just shooting it they've continued to make proof of concepts to continue to propel their careers and i feel like Plenty of people would at a certain point be like, oh, well, I've arrived. I don't need to do this anymore. They're a testament to continuing to create their own work. And I think that's how they've kept their momentum up. Yeah. I mean, I think you hear this story a lot where like someone just kind of moves up in the industry really fast and then they hit some weird roadblock and they realize that they need to change the whole way they do things. And I'm sure I mentioned this before, but I remember seeing Mark Wahlberg on like one of those Hollywood roundtable mm-hmm. conversations when he was nominated for, I think he'd produced um, some movie that was up for an, an Academy Award. And people are like, what's, how did you, you were like Marky Mark, you know, like how did you end up mm-hmm. producing Oscar nominated movies? And he was like, well, I realized that everyone just saw me as this very specific guy and they kept casting me as this thing, but I was never going to get those, those like George Clooney roles unless I produced the movie and I cast myself. And so out of necessity, I became a producer. And now like I'm more of a, you know, I'm still an actor, obviously, but also a producer. And you hear like Seth Rogen, you know, talks about like, I mean, the guy is still like writing and producing all these movies when he could easily just be like getting cast as the funny stoner guy in the Judd Apatow films. It's, you know, I think they kind of had a similar thing where they were like show running, writing, very much known for this like R-rated high school uh, genre. And they were like, well, we we want to act in these things, too. So now they're kind of showing how they would would look in these shows. So it's it's awesome. It's like, you know, when you're not getting what you when you when you're not being seen by people the way you want them to see you, you have to show them what you look like. You know, on that note, they are crowdfunding another proof of concept uh, that we talk about a decent amount on the show. But just to, to let people know if you're curious about what's going on. Um, stepfriend underscore show is their Instagram. They just launched. They're like in day three as of this recording. Speaking of crowdfunding, you should check out our Patreon. If you want to help support us, just tell us that you enjoy the show or that you're getting something out of it or it's uh, your film school. As uh, Selena and Marissa told us that they they were teaching screenwriting at the New York Film Academy and they told us that they told, told their students about our podcast. So if you at all feel like you get anything out of this, check out patreon.com slash just shoot a pod. You can give us a dollar, four dollars, twenty dollars a month, whatever you want for one month, for zero months. We'll take anything. That's right. So check out patreon.com slash just shoot a pod and throw us a buck or two. We really appreciate it. Now let's get into our conversation with Selena and Marissa. We're here with Marissa and Selena. Thank you. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. I'm just going to go get right into it. And you guys created the show Foursome. Matt and I were very familiar with the show, the idea of the show. You know, we've had people that have worked on the show, on the podcast in the past. Just to set the table, it is, it was an era where digital creators were selling shows. This is like Go90 time, you know, Foursome was a... A YouTube Red show, is that right? That's right. It started, yeah, yeah started as YouTube Red, then was YouTube 
premium, premium and then youtube or originals it rebranded three times yeah. within our four season stint yeah, yeah. And, and the stars the foursome were all influencers right no, it was 50 50. No. So oh, me. half, yeah, half of them were influencers. It was about 25% influencers. <laughs> <laughs> True 50 50 split. Wait, so, um, so who, who were the four foursome? The first it's kind of a revolving door. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> the, first, <laughs> the first season, it was Jen McAllister, aka Gen mm-hmm. X 10, um, Megan Falcone. Um, or Falcone, I might be saying. Falcone. Falcone. Yeah. Uh, Brooke Markham. Marm. Mm-hmm. And Logan Paul. Oh, he was not a foursome, Ricky but he Thompson. was. R- Ricky Thompson. Ricky Thompson was Ricky T. And then plus Logan Paul. And was gotcha. Logan Paul, he was like the vine guy that jumped over cars at the time. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. So, well, what so happened? Guess, Did he do anything? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's doing great. His brother's pretty good He's in the WWE. Yeah, 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 exactly. But okay. but so so it's interesting to hear that this was a traditional show because like, look, I I remember like driving down Sunset Boulevard and seeing that billboard. Did you see seeing, us standing outside like waving at yeah, our taking billboard? Selfies. <laughs> yeah, 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 with your iPhone fives, and you were so excited. But, but, you know, like, I, and I remember being aware of Gen X Pen because I, they think at the time she was repped by the same people that I was repped by. It was kind of like in that era where we we hadn't made the decision like, oh, do you become television or do you become an influencer? There was like digital managers that would rep kind of people like me and people like Jen at the same time. Right. It was like, yeah. OK, great. Yeah. Very confusing. Um, and so. I guess it, it, it's I understand why people would assume that you came up through the digital track rather than the traditional track. How did you feel about having a YouTube show? Like, that's got to be a little surprising or confusing. Like, wh- how did that happen? I guess. Well, what if we what if we just yeah, rewind a second to how you sold it? Was it like through a traditional kind of Hollywood agent manager type deal? Yeah, it was uh, our manager had a we had a general with Awesomeness TV. Um, And at the time, they weren't really doing scripted stuff. Mm -hmm. I think they had one Mm -hmm. scripted show. And the we were like, we definitely didn't didn't sell or we definitely like didn't make an impact there because we dressed the same. Marissa and I used to dress like twins for meetings. We were very uh, young. We were in our early 20s. Uh, Well, it was serious. Like we it was a bit, but it was also just part of our identity. We thought it was normal. What, so what, what, what did you what, what did you wear? <laughs> like we'd go shopping and buy head to toe the exact same outfit and go to meetings like that. But it wasn't like Reservoir Dogs suits or anything. It was like we were like the shining, the basic <laughs> shining twins. <laughs> um, after that awesomeness meeting, no, Bryn, hold, on, hold on, we can't drive past this. <laughs> So, but you two are very funny. You're selling like, you know, R-rated style comedies, but it's not part of your quote unquote brand that you're doing this. I guess I'm confused as to how, (laughs) like, it's not a bit, but it feels so bitty. (laughs) It was a bit. It like was a bit. bit. Also, (laughs) it was like, we would be, I'd be wearing a blue top and Marissa would be like wearing blue pants. We just like coordinated to be like. We're the same. Buy our show. Mm. I see. I mean, you know, we had Bonnie and Allison, this directing duo, on, and they were saying saying that they were they they were directing commercials for years, and they were saying that nobody like realized that they were the directors until they started. They decided, made a conscious decision: we're going to wear matching jumpsuits on every set. Yeah, yeah. And then, get it. yeah. And yeah, then yeah, they're like, all of a sudden, people are like, oh, sure. who are these people? Like, they have. There's something going on there. You but need it a was, little it was kind of, something. Yeah. And the, the jumpsuits, it's heightened. It's like part of all of their branding. You know, they've hyphenated their names. So I guess what I'm asking is, is, is it like that or was it was it more subtle? It's, no. It was like that, but it also was genuine. Like we didn't just do that for meetings. We did that <laughs> in real life. Like we would go on friend dates and we would wear the exact same outfit. Like. It wasn't something we were putting on just to go to these meetings. This is Did how we behave in the real world. Like at a Madewell or something? Like is that? Madewell? Are was, we 65 was, years old? 
Okay, I love like, Madewell. Madewell. You think it's oh, for now, 65 year olds? Back in the, when we were 20, we were like Forever 21, like bargain shopping, you know, like we were wearing oh, trash. I thought like 40 year old women shop at we Forever do. 21. We do. I just meant the years plus when we were 20. Forget <laughs> it. I'm Every 40 year old is going to come for me after this. <laughs> Brianna Taylor um, is going to come. Wait, so where did you guys meet? Ann Taylor and Loft? <laughs> where, it was a Chico. Pretty so it was much. A Chico. We, we, we met at musical theater school. Oh, so a rag. Pretty, pretty close. What's Jet Rag? Yeah. Yeah, um, no, which our, school? American Musical Dramatic Academy here in Los Angeles. I was Marissa's RA, and we got uh, busted for drinking, and then we moved in together. That's how we became partners. Is that Amda? And did you bust her? Or don't the RAs bust you? Well, they're supposed to, but I didn't. And then there was a picture taken of us drinking. And mm. then the rest is... What were you drinking? Do you remember? We were drinking out of a glass boot. <laughs> so who like, knows what we were like drinking? Zimas? That's how I got swine flu. That's, and that's not a joke. Oh my God, me too. <laughs> really? I got swine flu at that time. Yeah. From a boot? Cautionary tale yeah, yeah, for anyone true. drinking yeah. out of a boot still. So you guys, where did we Okay, so we, we had this meeting where we were dressed like the Shining Twins. Oh, right. And Bryn called our manager, this exec at the time called our manager and was like, what's going on with them dressing the same? No one's going to buy anything from these weird women who dress the same. And Wait, Bryn is someone from Awesomeness? She's an exec. Yeah. Okay. So she Ooh, took the meeting. She couldn't there. pay attention to anything you were saying because you were dressed the same. Yeah, she was like... And she I, called I, your manager with some feedback, which is... Honestly, like kind of nice. Uh, yeah. I love getting feedback and giving feedback, though sometimes I feel like I give a lot of unsolicited feedback. We don't like it. Like, we don't want you to tell us. Like I'm probably gonna harsh. tell you something about your website before the end of this episode. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Some things you need to work on. Uh, yeah. But yeah, sorry, go on. Um yeah, I she... bitch.com. Come on. That's right. But what, for for real, did it hurt your feelings? You said it was harsh, Marissa. Well, well, our manager didn't know we were doing that. So he called and was like, have you guys been wearing matching outfits on all of these meetings I've been sending you out on? And we were like, yeah. Because uh, just this is your meeting in person, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. It was pre-pandemic. So then we didn't hear from Awesomeness for a good minute. And then we heard from them like maybe six months later. And Brian Robbins was looking for a teenage sex in the city. So we pit, we went in, we developed a pitch and we pitched to get, we were like, there's four people in sex in the city. For some, <laughs> like, we <laughs> literally replaced the heads of the characters of sex in the city with like bobbleheads of influencers. Of influencers. Yeah. And ultimately, and how did you, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but how did you know client. that it should be influencers? Um, because they were, we had like Googled awesomeness TV and we saw that there was a bunch of influencers on their site. I think back oh, then, wow. back then we asked Jeeve. <laughs> right. That's so, it's funny because you do hear in Hollywood, like, and I don't know, I always use this example because, um, like I'd heard it once, like 10 years ago, but that like Natalie Portman is looking for a romantic comedy that she can be the lead in, you know, like you hear that someone is looking for something and then you like try to make up something for them and it never, ever works. But you guys basically did exactly that. That's been like our career. Someone's like, we want this. And we're like, here you go. And it's like the worst, flash, <laughs> fastest version of it. And then you get four seasons of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, though, honestly, I feel like so often you're like, oh, yeah, I should work on that. And then, you know, a couple other calls come in or you get distracted and you're ne- you, you know, realize later you open up your notes app and you're like, ah foursome oh well it's moved on right but like honestly just following through and delivering on the thing they ask for it it worked out right yeah yeah and yeah this was really early on in our careers too so like the fact that there was an open writing assignment that we were up for i mean we were all in we were 22 years old at this time awesome that's cool so you're legally drinking at this point yeah Mm -hmm. um and so were you your, did your manager say, hey, remember that company you met with, Awesomeness, they're looking for a teenage sex in the city. And then you guys basically wrote like in Word, a Word document and just like a couple paragraphs and like one, yeah, a PowerPoint. You're, you're saying PowerPoint, sorry. Uh, you're nodding your head. You, you had a PowerPoint document and you said, here's a couple paragraphs about the premise. Here's like some characters and here's no, a couple we, images. we went in and we had like a 30 minute pitch where we were very rehearsed and 
Yeah, we're like yeah. little we had the whole we, we had the whole season arced out episode ideas. You uh, know what would be cool? Do you guys know what quick change artists are? It's like a type of magician? No. <laughs> Oh, yeah, you you've seen it, it. It's like, you know, <laughs> like a person that like, like in half a second can change it. their entire outfit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're like, um, seen it you in guys, concerts. You yeah, guys yeah. should have done it at like four outfits and just like when it, like just point to some wait, is that uh, an airplane flying towards us? And then a like, quick you're, change. You're laughing, be, but we used to simultaneous. We used to put on change. berets. We at one point we had a fake mustache we put on when we were like a male character. We did some insane thing uh, in, i put in, in a room, nose in ring it. once yes like, like we would pretend to be the characters that we were put in a nose with. ring did you wear a turtleneck <laughs> that would have been so extreme um it is uh, and you guys are actors too right so hold on, hold on no 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 I, 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 <laughs> sorry i just think putting in a nose ring doesn't seem that crazy yeah it, it's but but like <laughs> basically you walk in dressed like yourself and then you, 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 okay, hold on. We're going to tell you about our show. You set things up. You hit play on the boombox. Mm-hmm. You yeah. would put on the mustache to be like, oh, I'm this character. And then you take the mustache <laughs> off and you put on the beret and you'd say, oh, I'm now this character or whatever. Like, <laughs> it would be that theatrical. Mm-hmm. Marissa has like a cane that she's pulling. <laughs> yeah. One time- I'm asking a real question, Orin. They're nodding yes. <laughs> this <laughs> isn't a bit. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm one- yes, ending everything. The audience is so mad we've sold something. <laughs> the one time we say. They're honestly jealous that they. <laughs> They all thought that this would never work, and then yeah. and it, and it yeah. works. Myself included. And what, <laughs> there you go. One time we sang a full theme song about a centaur mascot. It was like a two and a half minute theme song. <laughs> <laughs> this is why duos work because, yeah. like, a single yeah. person would never have the guts to do that. But when you're like you or the Daniels or whatever, and you're like, we're gonna fucking go down this burning ship together. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like you'll do crazy things and. It's cool. It's yeah. like people see you, you're passionate. If you, if you drop the bit halfway through, of course that doesn't work, right? But you can't yeah. leave your partner out to dry. So you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going to keep this mustache on and we're going to f- see it through. You know, yeah, like it would be like, easy to kind of like wuss Every out pitch is through. like yeah. the end of Little Miss Sunshine when the whole family gets yeah. on stage. It reminds me of, do you guys, have you heard the story about Will Ferrell um, when he was auditioning for SNL? With, when he played a cat? No, 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 not not during the the stage piece, but like like his meetings, he would go into like basically for an interview and he had planned this bit where he had a bunch of like monopoly money in a briefcase. And at the end of the and at the end of the meeting, he would be like, I'm just going to leave this right here and just kind of like pop open the briefcase as though he's bribing them and leave. Um, But he never had the guts to do it. And he had multiple meetings where he brought the briefcase. <laughs> And so he just felt like this nincompoop just like walking around like, oh, I guess Will Ferrell carries a briefcase. He does look like someone that could pull off a briefcase. Yeah, yeah. But like I would be the guy who's like, oh, what am I doing with this briefcase? I can't. I can't. And you two are just like, no, put on the mustache. Let's go. For better or for worse. Well, you had a billboard on Sunset Boulevard. So I think that's better. Four times, baby. Yeah, there you go. Really? Okay. Every season you got a new billboard? That's right. You and did. in Times Square. Whoa. How long does this billboard stay up? Maybe three uh, months. Oh, wow. Are you serious? Yeah. Yeah. We actually got multiple, multiple billboards in LA. It was because YouTube had like this built in marketing. Oh, that right. was so amazing. Bread. Yeah. And did you have your names on said billboard or were you on Are you billboard my dad? Or? Because he asked that exact same question. And the answer, well, I don't know if you really are connected to this show. And the answer is no. Do they ever put the right, the showrunners names on the billboard in tiny print? Sure. Yes. From Steven Spielberg. Yeah. Animaniacs. I mean, S&M are as notice, like recognizable as Steven Spielberg. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah we're yeah, the yeah. same. Yeah. Yeah, except twice as fun. <laughs> so, um, so you so you sell a show at twenty two, right? And it is kind of like yeah. this crazy time in in media where like that's that's the thing that's happening all over the place, right? But yeah. then you two and they have are a combined sh- forty four years of experience. <laughs> there you go. Um, and then your show are you show running season one? Yeah, yeah. So so it was interesting because. 
YouTube didn't uh, wasn't originally on the show. So we had sold the show to Awesomeness. They picked mm-hmm. up the first season for six episodes and we had to write every episode in a two act structure mm-hmm. so that they could potentially break them each episode into 11 minutes and post them on their YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Um, So we had filmed the entire first season. Selena and I wrote the entire first season, just the two of us. We had filmed the entire first season and then we got distribution through YouTube originals. My favorite. But but awesomeness paid for it, like financed it. Correct. And my favorite. Are we allowed to ask you what the budget was? Yeah, it was like 1.2 million for six episodes. Oh, wow. That's a ton. tight. Oh, <laughs> well, I, I think like I worked on one of the first YouTube red shows, my music. Um, and they, it was like the fine brothers and it was, um, it was, I think like a similar length. And I think they were giving like a million dollars to these influencers, but in exchange you had to, they had to cr- like generate like a mm-hmm. hundred hours of content or some, some insane number of content. So they would, the show itself would be like, three hours of content or something. And then they would just do all these live streams with the, with the cast and just all this insane ancillary stuff. But then they would give like Amy Poehler or Shaquille O'Neal, like $5 million to like do one interview with like about science or something, okay. you know? So it was, it seemed very uh, uneven, but 1.2 at that time for a show that was just going to go on YouTube. Um, that's like, a, I think that's for your first, it was that, that was kind of your first show that you guys produced and, that was our first sale. That was like our first anything. And we went straight from like never being in a writing room to uh, show running. To running. Yeah. yeah. I, yeah. I think also, Orin, it's important to point out like, you know, during the time, all of those deals. Yes. Like I think Amy Poehler had like a show that was essentially just interviews over Zoom. And Foursome was like a like a TV show. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it was high like school six half hour episodes of like their yeah. background. There's you know, so so 1.2 is a lot of money for a Zoom show and very tight for six half hour episodes. Yeah, but when you were 22, if someone gave you 1.2 million, oh like, I mean, we talk we talk to people that make features for like fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we don't, I, but I they email be, us to try to get on the podcast every single I would day. <laughs> be driving a Ferrari to set every day yeah. <laughs> for about you know thirty days, basically. By our last um, season, what were we? I think our our budget went up to four million. Oh wow! I awesome. honestly was just trying to remember, but was I know it? just our very last episode that we, the finale that we directed, was a million dollars. So it had to have been even more than four million. The truth was it fully union, like DGA SAG IATSE? Not DGA, yeah. not DGA. It, oh, WGA, right, not DGA. Well, because it was WGA, it was WGA, but DGA, it was like we had a director who was like, "I don't want to do another episode because then I'd have to join DGA." So maybe it mm. wasn't. I think that's because it was DGA, so he was getting too many minutes Can you believe and he wanted that to stay non-union. We show ran <laughs> that show. Union. Yeah, we, sh- we show ran a show and we're like, who was on it? How was it DGA? I don't know. <laughs> but it was, but it was a, a, Yahtzee does make a huge difference. It's like literally costs twice as much, 40% more. <laughs> Um, so season one, it wasn't Ayatsi and it flipped during like season no. two. Because I remember yeah, it was a big Because that budget deal. is kind of like, it's kind of not... I know it seems like a tiny budget now, but this was like, what, eight years ago or something? Uh, <laughs> did you guys yeah. really, did you just stand by the billboard and claim to create this show? You should have seen our first season. We were such doofuses. We, like, I wish that we would have realized what an amazing opportunity it was. And also, like, what we could have been doing and learning, like, we could have progressed our mm. career so much but because we were fucking doinks we would hide we wanted to hang out with the kids we, you know we're actresses first and i think that it was i uh, we wanted to play two of the roles and they wouldn't let us um are you so- serious were you like we only need 50 we have too many influencers <laughs> they <laughs> only 50 were- percent influence yeah it's hard back then there wasn't like a ton of multi-hyphenate situations happening it was before broad city you know they just were like you're this you're one thing and they didn't want to cross over and we didn't, we were too afraid to fight for it. Now we know you have to fight, like from the very beginning. Um, it can't be like, you have to be able to walk away. And at that time we were like, let's just see where this ride takes us. But because of that, we were super focused on like being best friends with all the actors because that's what was important to us. So we used to hide, we wrote every episode, we would hide from production meetings in like 
under table and like under we literally <laughs> hid in a janitor's closet during one lunch because we were like we so need cliche. a break we're and like, then did somebody <laughs> open the door and you guys were pretending to make out <laughs> pretend like, yeah pretending <laughs> you're like no we have nothing we're not running this show um that teenagers. actually ended up being the parts that we were allowed to play was stoner lesbian number one and number two and that's what we did on the show was make out oh, that's cool and we, how did you guys um decide who was number one and number two i think it flip-flopped every season because we couldn't really remember <laughs> wait you're recurring Your method you didn't bother to name <laughs> <laughs> We didn't think it was going to get picked up. And when it did, we had already played these fucking characters. So we were like, all right, guess Stoner Lesbian 1 and 2 uh, coming back every season, even though it makes no sense in the series. Like Marina yeah. and Selene, Celissa. <laughs> um, yeah. So well, 2016, I, I, by the way, it seems like is when it, I, since was, you guys yeah, aren't that familiar with the show. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. and so, uh, well, <laughs> yeah, that, that makes sense. But so, uh, what, um, going back to, the, you know, the things that you wish you had paid more attention to, what, what are, what are a few things you were like, ah, oh, man, if I could do it all over again, I maybe would have, you know, not hidden in the closet. I hear that. Um, well, so by season three, we were like, we started to have ambitions to direct mm -hmm. and they told us that we needed to prove ourselves. We had never directed anything. And so while we were in the writing room for season three, we started, we, um, we did a proof of concept for something else. And like, that is something we could have done on the hiatus and we could have sure. learned so much from the director. Uh, it was Amy Ark Rubin. She directed the entire first season. Mm -hmm. um, if we would have just shadowed her, like we could have bumped that forward. So we've been using this term showrunner, like you've been mm -hmm. showrunning this thing. Um, were you producing and were you like overseeing the edits as yeah. well? Like on the first season? Yeah, we were yes. fully peed. Were you deciding where the budget goes? No, they did not show us any budget. Like Awesomeness TV was pretty uh, close to the brass on what the budget was. Uh, since like that's another thing like i wish we would have realized what a line producer's job was and then like mm -hmm. learned that aspect of the job even though they probably wouldn't have showed us regardless but i think if we treated it more like a learning experience and not like we were spies that we're gonna like tell on them we could have learned a lot about what a true showrunner does with budget on a show yeah i mean it's i mean it's tough when it's your first job like you're saying like we should have like put our foot down and said we're gonna walk away unless we get this stuff but like you can't really do it you're just so thankful that someone made the mistake of hiring it you know and then yes. and then you get a second season a third it seems like by the third season which it sounds like that's when you guys finally were like hey this is this exists because of us like we're getting all this money we're getting all these people hired like we want to choose what the shots are and we, talk to the actors. Yeah, we were contracted for the first two seasons when we sold the show. And so we started by season three and season four, we started to negotiate for ourselves. And we, one of the things that we negotiated for was hiring power. We didn't have that at first. It made the mm -hmm. biggest um, difference. Like we couldn't believe. Like in terms of like DP, production designer, everything. casting. When you, everyone, everyone, yeah. We hired everyone. You're like the craft service was... Truly, we hired horrible. literally. We tr hired every <laughs> department head. We it was like mainly women. Our fourth season, um, we promoted within for our DP was a camera op on seasons one and two, and we made her our awesome. DP. And she, the energy on set, like it was just night and day. Third, our third season was really rough, so rough to the fact that we didn't think we were going to come back. And basically, we had left awesomeness, being like m mutually being like, we'll never see each other again basically like bad mm -hmm. blood baby taylor swift and then we get a call no joke five days later from the same same execs that we were like really mad at and they were like you've been picked up and we just laughed <laughs> we just laughed for like 10 minutes and then they hung up on us and then they took us to dinner and are like what's it gonna take for you to come back and we were like they took us to nobu oh yeah mm -hmm. That's a good one. And then they left when the check got there. <laughs> like, no, oh, we, sorry, we did not realize this was a fancy. Marissa <laughs> and I always pretend that we're going to pay for that. We always like pat our chest, like where wallets would never be to pay for the check. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that was my prom. I, I'm curious though, like what, um, what specifically 
made you so upset? Do you know what I mean? Like what, what, where did that bad blood come from? I'm sure, you know, it's stuff that builds over two seasons, right? And if you like, if you don't want to talk about it, it's okay for sure. But like, I'm curious if there's a learning lesson, if there's a way to extrapolate without naming names or anything like that, like what, how would, how do you wish things had gone differently, basically? No, it was a definitely a combo of things. I mean, a big part of it was we were shooting on location in Malibu and we were, our hours were insane. So Mm -hmm. like, Crew members were getting in car accidents on their drives home because there was no budget for people to stay in hotels. Like people were just very overworked. And so the attitude on set was was rough. Like the mm-hmm. cruff, the the um the crew truly felt abused, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, it's it's it went from being a really like We're in a team, we're a family to this tense atmosphere. (laughs) And it was at a time, I think, when awesomeness was selling too. So there wasn't even a rep from awesomeness there. And like Selena said, we didn't really have control of how the budget was being spent. So that was that was a huge issue. Um, Our line producer would accuse us of cheating the lead. So like she was like, we're over because you guys are crunching the courier new font and making this and we were like are you wildly crazy and then we came in under budget which just shows you how bad things were and also like we did plenty of things that were not good like we are equally to blame in kind of like attitude and vibe and stuff you know Mm -hmm. like when you're young you're just angry about everything Sure. And we're so fortunate that we were able to come back fourth season and like end on the best note. We had a great fourth season. Okay. So you have this, what ends up being kind of like a hit show, right? You have four seasons of this thing. By the end, you're getting a million dollars an episode. And that's you You guys have to split that million dollars or you guys each get this million dollars. We personally were not getting a million dollars an episode. We got it. We, okay. um, we got it. Okay, seven hundred after the manager's fees. I understand. Um, <laughs> no, but then so what's uh no I'm you know million dollar budget, which is a lot. How do you guys parlay that into like the next step of your career? So it kind of broke our brains. Like we went from selling the show mm-hmm. in our early twenties that was immediately you know picked up to series. And then from there, ran for four seasons. And after that, we got a um, blind deal at Nickelodeon because a lot of the people from Awesomeness had moved over to Nickelodeon. Mm-hmm. Um, and we oh, sold that a makes pilot. this graphic I'm looking at make sense on your website. Big Nick Energy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we love a theme. Funny. We love a little pun. We wrote that on the greeting cards and put it on our shirts at Nickelodeon. We're surprised. Yeah, like honor. My name is. Oh, that's funny. Is Big Nick Energy? Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like cool. that. So was it Nickelodeon like the like for kids? Nickelodeon proper. Yeah. They had come to us and we're like, we'll give you a blind. And we're like, we can't write kids stuff. And they're like, yeah, you'll be mm-hmm. fine. And then we pitched them like five ideas. And they were like, just to give you a little sample. One of them was called Don't Tell Mikey about a kid who has a beautiful life and wakes up in a coma and realizes his life's terrible. <laughs> Wait, he wakes up in a <laughs> coma? Wakes up from he, a coma. Like, yeah. yeah, he was in a coma, he had a beautiful life, he wakes yeah, up and, and then like, his life is huh? terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and that was called Don't Wake Mikey. <laughs> That's what it's called. He's like, I want to go back, I want to go back. Yeah. 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 And they're like, That's pretty good. What else you got? What, uh, give us a- <laughs> I can't even remember. And we were like, we can't do it. And they were like, all right, how about we reboot something? So we ended up um, partnering with Ace Entertainment to pitch on the reboot of Salute Your Short. We sold the reboot in the room and we left the room and they were like, they just bought the, they, we kind of didn't understand what happened and they were like, they just bought the mm-hmm. pilot. And I started crying because I was like, they didn't buy the whole series. Like they didn't like it. Wait, can I ask how long after you've, you wrapped up for some this was? Is this like years? Like were you guys desperate or was this like two weeks later? It was like five years. You guys were flying it was high. It was within Within the you year, took yeah. the meeting, take every meeting under the billboard. But, but, but hold on, I, I feel like we sped past the the beat where we you're paying off how uh, 
Oh, it broke our brains. It broke your brains. Exactly. Yeah. Like the, the, to sell a pilot in the room is a huge success, but, but you were didn't disappointed. Know that. You, you didn't realize that. We were yeah, like, yeah. They, didn't, they only bought one episode. They must have hated it. And by the way, we pitched that with poster board, like a trifold and Velcro underpants that we would stick on them, <laughs> that we stuck on the trifold. But we were not in matching outfits. Uh, you know, you, you guys, you're really teaching me like some visual aids are the way to go. Right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, this is awesome. And, and it's so much better than like, I feel like there was this era where I was like trying to pitch things and I'm like, can I plug my laptop into your HDMI cable? And they're yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> like I, rolling their eyes. But you guys bring the trifold and you have like a choreographed mm-hmm. beret toss. You guys <laughs> yeah. have tearaway underpants. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so, when, yeah, we, that's awesome. when I started crying, our producer at Ace was like, you're actually insufferable. And like everyone <laughs> will, will hate you if you don't change. And so we did. That's cool. Were you wearing the same outfit for like two weeks? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, OK, so you sold the pilot to this reboot of Salute Your Shorts. Uh, was it called... Salute your lungs. What was it? Did it have a? Was it the same name? Yeah, it was the same name. Yeah, yeah. I'll salute your shorts. Um, and then the day after we turned the pilot in, the pandemic hit. Mm. Classic. So pandemic everything move. was yeah. Everything was on hold for a while. We did um, also like, though. It's just two weeks. We'll get. We'll be back in the room in like two to three weeks. Totally. The also at the same time, like kind of like maybe at the, yeah, and at the same time, maybe six months before this. So while we were like developing Salute, we had seen in the trades an article that said an InSync movie was being developed and that Lance Bass was looking for a writer. So we emailed Mm. our team and we we kind of skipped past a pretty important part of our careers, but I'll finish this story so it doesn't get wild. But anyway, we saw the trades. And then Lance Bass, wait, can I guess, did he go to space (laughs) halfway through production? (laughs) That was like when we were in high school. Um, Uh, So we saw the trades, told our agents, we were like, you got to get us in. And they're like, they're hiring like the people that wrote the heat. And we're like, just get us a general. So we had a general and we dressed in like full in sync shirts from seventh grade with like butterfly clips, the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. And we were like, Mm -hmm. the heat, the Melissa McCarthy, Sandra Bullock movie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Not like the Robert De Niro, uh, Al Pacino. I think they would have taken either writer, but I think they were talking about the Sandra Bullock heat. (laughs) Sure. Okay. That's a Katie Dippel movie, right? She was like, yeah. Actually, it was pretty good. It's pretty good. Yeah, now that yeah, it's funny. It. Yeah, it's, it was great. Yeah, they have to put the knife back in. You guys remember that set piece? Oh yeah, that's funny. That that beat is really funny. Like Sandra Bullock has, or maybe no, Melissa McCarthy has a knife in her leg. She's like tied up in a chair, and then like they pull it out, and then realize that the you know their captors are on their way back in, and so they have to put the knife back into the. <laughs> It's funny. It's really good. Yeah. Anyway, Selena, you were saying. Anyway, so we pitched. They were like, the producer was like, I like you, weird girls. You can pitch. We're like, great. So we pitched. We ended up pitching. A, we broke the whole movie, hardcore PowerPoint, all the way to the head of TriStar. And we were like, we got this job. We were so stoked. And then we got a call from our reps that are like, Rachel Bloom got the job. She, she, you know, sure. a general the day before and, sure. you know, yeah, yeah. give it to her. Yeah. We, so then we saw, then we forget about it. Salute happens. The pandemic happens. And we get a call like kind of early on in the pandemic being like, they want you to write your take with Rachel. So kind of during, oh. during the pandemic. Like we, to be co-writers with her. That's right. Yeah. Oh, so they liked your pitch, but they just want liked her pedigree. This is after crazy ex-girlfriend and all that stuff, right? Correct. Yeah. And then we wrote. A movie that they did not like. <laughs> we got, we didn't get hired. Like the three of you work together. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. And then, do you get you get paid for that though, right? <laughs> yeah, we got paid. Yes. And thank- WGA. WGA was like a forty million dollar budget movie, so it was you know high budget. Oh, so that shows so that was a good experience. You were writing like a studio film. Yeah, and yeah. Um, and it raised our quote. So we're like. Rachel's like will be so thankful to her forever. That's awesome. And so, in the, at the same time, you have your pilots for Salute Your Shorts. 
Yeah. So you guys are like having lunch at the IV mm-hmm. and well, mm-hmm. having listen, drinks at the Chateau. There was a little bit of a like dark night of soul moment before these two things happened, which was remember the whole packaging shenanigans with the agents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So after foursome, we had wrote this movie Bat Mitzvah based on my mm-hmm. real life story of getting Bat Mitzvah for my 30th birthday. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. And did you have a Bat Mitzvah earlier in no. life or was that your first one? No, no she's like, like, hey, are you Jewish? I, yeah. com- I wanted to do a themed party and I committed to the bit and like fully went to Hebrew school during the fourth season. Um, okay. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> hold on. Wait. So you converted to throw yourself? No, she is Jewish. Okay. <laughs> she, yeah, confusing because you said committed to the bit themed party. Yeah. She was raised Jewish. <laughs> but you do realize how offensive this is to actual Jewish people. Uh, sorry, fully Jewish. Uh, just never was bat mitzvah. Gotcha. <laughs> That's not fully. <laughs> right, you have to study. <laughs> Partially <laughs> Jewish. Totally, oh, that was my bad. <laughs> no. My bubby is just like rolling in her grave. Um, I think a bubby is a grandfather. No. If you were Jewish, you would know. No, that's wrong. Have you heard of bub and grandmas? Yeah. <laughs> Which one do you think is the grandma? I don't know what, what is happening. But basically, during the packaging, shenan- well, before that, we had written this movie and then we were up for like a rewrite job on Hocus Pocus and our friend Jillian mm. Bell was in Sundance for Britney runs a marathon. And we were like, can we come with to have like a writing retreat? And she said, sure. And we watched the Britney runs a marathon Sundance extravaganza where it like won the audience award and got, was one of the highest sales of that year. Sold the next day to Amazon. Yeah. Everyone's been running marathons ever since. (laughs) And we, and it inspired us in the worst way. We were like, us too can do things like she did. And we emailed UTA and our manager at the time, I think, was before it was Artist First, it was Prince Artist. Otto. And mm-hmm. we were like, I want to act in this movie. We want to direct it. We're going to do Britney Runs a Marathon. <laughs> we're taking this to Sundance. For the Bat Mitzvah movie. Finally yeah. figured that Not out. For salute I'll, your shorts. Okay. I'll, I'll make a hit Sundance film. That'll be my ticket. Yeah, everything yeah. else had been so easy. So we were like, like, it's that hard. And they were like, well, no, we're not going to support you. We don't want, this was like pretty quickly after foursome. And I think after the easy money was gone, they were like, we're not going to support you guys as multi-hyphenates. We'll support you as writers in as staff writers. And that's it. So we fired everyone one month or two months or something before the packaging where everyone had to fire everyone. Mm, and it was no, like, trailblazers. we totally were, but it was so, <laughs> empowering because then the wga direct stuff came out and we realized that we could just start calling and emailing people ourselves and that's when we sold salute yeah so we sold salute with no reps um so what is that sorry for us non-wga members can you just tell us what that means that like you could just uh look up like who the executives were at different companies and just email them that's right yeah so because the wga you know, had made it so that everyone had to drop their agents until they would sign this agreement, this this packaging agreement. Um, they did something called like WGA Direct, and it was this online portal where it listed all these execs' emails. So we just started cold reaching out, and we were getting like more meetings than we had ever gotten mm-hmm. previously. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. And you were, and this is for just just for WGA members. Yeah, but yeah. but most of our emails came from either re-emailing people that we had their emails but kind of were too afraid. We had always been like, it's mm-hmm. not appropriate. Um, mm-hmm. Or just like IMDB proing before they all took their emails off because everyone started sure. doing it. Because we were just cold yeah. emailing people. Because a famous podcast told people they just get an IMDB pro account and that's yeah, how they go. can contact anyone they want. But, uh, but you, what you're saying is that you were yeah. empowered, basically, right? It was like, oh... Sometimes there's so much protocol in Hollywood. It feels scary. You don't want to step on toes. Like you, you know, you'll side channel with someone to be like, "Is it okay for me to reach out to this person or or whatever?" And now you two are just like, "Oh no, I'll I'll just email them." It's they've got to just be Zach at you know whatever dot com yeah. Zach yeah. Efron at gmail dot yeah. com. Yeah. yeah, you figure it out pretty quickly. You know whether that's listed on IMDb Pro or not. Yeah, you know? yeah, totally. We met my daughter. Really empowered. 
My daughter thinks yesterday she came to me. She's like, dad, I found Taylor Swift's email address, her Gmail address. And I'm now I can now I know I can send her a Gmail. And I was like, well, first of all, it's called an email. Mm-hmm. And she's like, no, I'm using Gmail. I'm like, I know, but it's called an email. And uh, and like that, it's not her email address. Anyway, she does not believe me. Did but you, she's just waiting till she comes up with the perfect thing to say. Did you tell her she wants a response? You. Did you tell her Santa Claus isn't real too while you were at it? No. I'm not that Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so you guys had sold Salute Your Shorts. You were writing you're writing this movie with Rachel Bloom and then what happened next? What what year are we? We're in COVID time still. Well, yeah, 20 20- Funny, I guess. And then um, at the same time, right before that, too, we decided let's film our first proof of concept for a TV show that Bennett Silverman actually directed, who was our mentor in Foursome. And we wrote and acted in it. And we used that to then attach. We sold it to Sony and to Counterbalance. Counterbalance. Who's the Cobra um, Kai team. Cobra Kai, the Netflix show. Right. Uh, started oh. as YouTube Red, though. Oh, sorry, the YouTube Red twisted. Show. I guess kind of the obvious question is, you wrote a script, you tried to sell it, no one was biting, and then you're like, we should film this to show people what it feels like and what the tone is? Wow, or... that's the meanest. No. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess why, like, because you're repped writers, you have a track Open record. You've you're selling things. Written why? a movie with your crazy yeah. ex-girlfriend. Because yeah. we um, want to act. We want to act. So you have to, Mm -hmm. we have to audition. That's a proof of concept for you as actors, not for you as directors or producers. Well, it was a proof of concept for the show um, that, you know, we had a full length version of, but also as ourselves as actors. So that when we went to pitch the show, people have watched the proof of concept and we're already in their minds as the characters. Okay. that And was that your idea or like how... Like how, I mean, it's funny because when this podcast started like 200 years ago, I was just so into proof of concept. I was like, I'm going to, this year I'm shooting a proof of concept for my feature, for my show, for my whatever. And now I'm, for some reason, I'm like really over it, uh, over proof of concept. Cause like I've, I've seen it, I haven't seen it like work that much, but then, but I'm, I'm not an actor. So it's a different thing. Like, um, I guess I'm curious, like. Like how, why you thought it would work? Like, had you seen it work before? And then kind of like what the reaction was? Well, we wanted to do this because, you know, we had gone from four seasons of a show where we were working steady. We had these other opportunities up in the air, which ended up not going. But we wanted to film something like we just wanted to continue. We wanted to go into production. And the only way that we could make that happen was to do it ourselves. Um, and Bennett, you know, same thing. He wanted, he wanted to direct something. So we kind of all met and we're like, let's just do it ourselves. Let's shoot something. We were starting to listen to podcasts and we saw one called just shoot it. And we were like, Hey, just, we should hey, just shoot we're it. not going to go deeper than the title. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just start Give there and we'll see if it's it. it was just too long of search engines it wasn't really going to work out for us <laughs> is um, um were you not interested were you like pursuing staff writing or any of that type of s- stuff as writers no that's a mistake just- that's a mistake we made early in our career we were like we took a big stance against staff writing because we were like we just show ran and broke a network's mm-hmm. record and it felt to us a little sexist like all these dudes we knew that like had done way less for like show running their own shows and we were like we actually did it now you want us to staff but that was dumb um we wish we like if we could have one piece of advice that we would have followed when we were younger it's take every opportunity and learn like you're not mm-hmm. too big for anything learn from everything it'll make you a better artist and we could have learned from so many smarter, better showrunners. And we also would have like made money and maybe like lived a easier life than we have. Yeah. Well, right. And then yeah. you could probably finance your proof of concept a little better or, or easier. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. We wouldn't be crowdsourcing right now. <laughs> sure, <We're>, sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which we'll, we'll get to in just a second. I, you know, I, I totally hear and, and sympathize with what you're saying for sure. And I think feel like maybe at that time kind of had that mentality a little bit as well. But there is a part of me that looks at your career and like the fact that you're selling things and like, you know, making it happen and all of these, uh, you know, all the highlights are all so awesome. I could understand the mentality of not wanting to dilute your brand if you're creators if you're like 
literally just creating things all the time, you know, and then you enter a room as like a baby writer that does sort of complicate how your team sells you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I look at like Marissa and Selena, not as baby writers. It's like they've, Right. Like they've well, done that's what the, that's what I'm film, right? And, right, right, right. But like when I say baby writer, I mean like at staff like writers. Baby. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like you yeah. haven't been, yeah, I guess a staff writer on a TV show. Well, right. we would have had a we would have had a high title, like we would have been a higher level writer. Sure. But sure. I don't know. Like the things that used to mean something back then are all blurred now. Now a job is sure. a job and you just take whatever you can get because the sure. industry is wild. Yeah, um, in 2024, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you can call me a baby if you want. Post strike. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We'll, like, we will go be writer's assistants and be like, what's a golden rod script? Like, we will figure it out. Um, yeah, yeah. But, like, for that proof of concept for that TV show called Bad Apple that we shot, that we paid for ourselves, right? I think it was $8,000 all in. Mm-hmm. One day uh, that we then. Sp- optioned and sold and have a cool team we have showrunners attached so like we're not even Wait, can i can i ask sorry just a de- like how many scenes did you shoot like what was the what in your mind was the enough to capture what you needed to it was like six capture. it's ended up being around six minutes it's basically two scenes it's one location shot in one day <laughs> selena and i with just one other actor that came in for like two hours and do you feel like that proof of concept is why you sold it or do you think that's just why you're set up to start in it? Yes. It's hard, I, to, it's hard to know. I think it's um, why I think it's why we got a pitch. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know. We probably would have gotten a pitch, but I think that the proof of concept made the acting side not like it wouldn't have been a conversation without it. Like at the, because mm-hmm. they saw us as the characters, when we then pitched ourselves on PowerPoint, uh with our own headshots and stuff, like they immediately, Sony was so supportive. Like it hasn't, mm-hmm. we're shocked that it hasn't been one question. We, we just kind of got finished pitching the first round and which is wild. There's only like four buyers right now. Um, sure. And not one of the buyers were like, so are you open to, you know, not being in it, which is the question we have gotten every pitch in the past. And this wasn't one of them. Yeah. What what else is nice about it is like when one is shooting a proof of ch- concept, generally the challenge is casting, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to pitch you this movie and here's like a scene from it. But also none of the actors in the, in the scene are actually going to be the movie stars of this movie. So just use your imagination and that just gets muddy, right? Right. You have the opposite, right? You're like, you're proving this works and only you two can do it the way you want to do it. You know, yeah, no pressure. And it's pretty great. Yeah. And I guess there are the models, right? The broad cities and the pen 15s and like the sure. kind of like seeing that this show is just, it's like a character based show. Right. And these are the, yeah, those yeah. are definitely our North stars. Yeah. Napoleon dynamite. I mean, we use all that. We use all the proof of concept examples of like multi hyphenate actor, mm-hmm. writer, mm-hmm. So. Yeah, that one. That's a recent one. Um, so, what's like? What's the next step? Just so brutal. Um, so currently, we are crowdsourcing for our next proof of concept, which is going to be a much larger budget than that eight thousand dollar one that we did last time. Our budget We're gonna is be seventy thousand dollars. Oh, cool! And so, what are, is it? Is like the strategy to have like just like a lot of things that like you have this show that is in a certain stage of development and now you're kind of doing another proof of concept like while the bad apple is like brewing at counterbalance with counterbalance so we took that show out to buyers and we're still waiting to hear <laughs> okay um so you're so starting on the next thing just we're starting on the next. to have we multiple just, things we have yeah, like exactly we have momentum i would say we've got like three tv shows at all different levels at all times and two movies at two different levels at all times and mm-hmm. always know you're saying as a rule that's like what you're always like that's how many burners you want going basically yeah why so seventy thousand dollars is a lot of money right a lot and not just a lot of money to to raise but like crowdfund right like crowdfunding we're, is complicated in that yeah, way we're splitting, you know? we're splitting so we're 
I mean, it's all crowdfunding, but we're doing um, $40,000 through a fiscal sponsorship and trying to go uh-huh. through like, like companies and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then we're doing it's a tax write offs, basically. Exactly. Yeah. And companies and this- like Hollywood companies are like at like a dentistry. Both. Type of Both. Whatever oh. we can get. Okay. And um, so then, then 30,000 yeah. through a. 30,000 through Indiegogo. Um, we're on day three. Oh, cool. Of 30. Congratulations. We never <laughs> plug crowdsourcing, but we'll do it now. Really? <laughs> what's, your, what's your thing? What's your. The show is. How do you, people find it? Oh, how do people find it? We're on all the platforms. We learned how to TikTok and we are reposting them on Instagram like boomers. Um, but our, um, is- our handle on Instagram is stepfriend underscore show. Step friend? Is it about? I marry Mar- the concept. Yeah, I marry yeah. Marissa's concept is, dad. And now okay. she's my same age stepmom. That's, That's cool. That's very funny. And, and is this kind of- not based on a true story? I wish. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Scott Shields is like, please, I hate this. Um, Marissa's dad. <laughs> it, it's kind of based off the fact that like, I would joke around about having a crush on Marissa's dad um, just as a bit. And then we started thinking, we've always really wanted to do a self-aware multicam, like um, a subversive multicam that the studio audience is a character within itself in the show. We, our brand is R-rated comedy nostalgia. So anything nostalgic is like our mm-hmm. fave thing to right. do. Like Marissa's dad. <laughs> Just like Marissa's dad. So then we, I, Marissa also like looks a lot like her dad. And I'm like, part of the reason I feel like that could be interesting for a show is that if you're in love with your, with a man because he looks like your best friend, it's really because you're in love with your best friend so much. Do the characters know they're in a sitcom? No. No, it's more grounded than that. Like, it's like a more grounded too many cooks. So they interact <laughs> with the laugh track. It can be more grounded than that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not literally an outer space. It's just <laughs> the substratosphere. Like orbit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, for example, the, when something weird happens, like the laugh track will get so high pitched that a bird falls out of the sky and dies. And they'll like notice the bird oh, on the cool. ground, but they won't realize that the laugh track is what killed the bird. It's like Stranger Than Fiction meets mm. uh, The Truman Show mm-hmm. meets uh, WandaVision. Totally. Yes. That's how but we that's how we pitch it in our PowerPoint. Comedy. Meets step by step, maybe? Yes. We <laughs> yeah. just posted a yeah. uh, poll of which dad would you rather make whoopee with? Patrick Duffy from Step by Step or Alan Thick from uh Oh from Growing, Growing Pains. Pain. Sure. The father of blurred lines. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's right. R. I. P. That's right. So okay, so that kind of And is that part of your whole question? Fun, sorry, your crowdfunding. I think you're probably going to ask them about. Yes, because that happened. You're killing me. I've been trying to sorry, ask for twenty minutes, and you only want to do bits. <laughs> sorry, really I, bring- I'm, I'm not used to being on the podcast with funny people. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, man. I'll, I'll so turn my mic off. So that that's why the 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 jump from eight thousand dollars to seventy thousand dollars makes sense, right? It's like okay. It's not yeah. just that the concept, the concept requires a level of production and a level of, of timing or planning or just scale that, that necessitates this big jump. It's such a specific tone and we really need to get it right in order for the proof of concept to be of value. So, you know, we're shooting at a soundstage. We have a whole cast um, and it's going to be a multiple day shoot. Yeah. And you're building the set, building like the... We're not building the set. We found an amazing studio in North Hollywood c- called Cinepack Studio. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys... Have you guys shot there? I think so. D-I-N-E? Yeah. Keep going. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. And they have like... we. It was hard because everything else we looked at was very 70s. Um, and that wasn't right. Like it was going to look insane. And we, and we couldn't find a house that looked 90s enough that wouldn't be so expensive to set deck. So mm-hmm. then we found this this studio which had like the perfect amount of n- 90s wood paneling that wasn't too much that you could like dress to look different enough. So we got real lucky and plus we can ride our bikes there. Oh, that's awesome. Do you Are guys you uh, have matching point? bikes? <laughs> Not the exact same but pretty close, yeah. 
cool. It's yeah. I guess you could have just gotten a tandem bike. Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> that would money. be so cute. <laughs> They're they're uh, pretty hard to uh, ride, I I think actually. Oh yeah, no, I um, <clears throat> I went to Europe once and with a friend, and she, unbeknownst to me, after I rented the tandem bike, let me know she'd never ridden a bike before, and I was basically doing like a hundred percent of the work, <laughs> and she was like, I was like a rickshaw driver. That would be Marissa. Um, I've got such that little was, legs. That was like, have you ever done one of those bar bikes? Mm-hmm. Oh, like where you're drinking, like a bachelorette yeah, it's party. Yeah, the worst idea thing? ever. Yeah, because everyone's drinking, so they just stop yeah. pedaling. But it's like it takes a lot of effort. That's like the swan boats at Echo Park Lake. Like m- my kids won't do anything. It's just me <laughs> carrying the whole family. Um. Okay. So where are we now? Now you're crowdfunding. Yeah. Yeah. So so I guess my question is like next is are you taking it out to sell after that? Yeah. And if First, so, why well, we'll, are people crowdfunding? We'll do um we'll do film festivals first. I and see. Mm. and we're hoping that people will crowdfund because they want to see the show. And like mm-hmm. there's no, you know, there's no original shows really that are selling. It's like one every six, you know, maybe. And there's it's just harder to get original, especially comedic, female led comedic content sold. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. think that hopefully audiences and people that are donating want that. Like, I think the fact that like we got a ton of donations today because we posted a TikTok where we like, we're doing dumb comedic bits over TikTok trends. I think there's a want for comedy. Um, so that's Mm -hmm. why we're hoping people donate so that more stuff like it can get made. Um, well, awesome. Well, I'm following you on Instagram now, so yeah, oh, you so you'll much. probably see the donation skyrocket because uh, when I make moves like this, yeah. And if anyone works happen. for a large conglomerate, just set us up, <laughs> <laughs> or yeah. just needs a tax write off, right? Because uh, uh, walk us through fiscal sponsorship real quick as a as a way. Yes, yeah, to- so we've we've partnered with Creative Visions. They're a five hundred one three C, five hundred one C three. Did I say that? You right? said it. Yeah. You said it right. <laughs> Okay, cool. <laughs> um, so they are, are a non for profit, which makes us, uh, they take a fee and it makes us eligible um, to be a tax write off for anyone who donates through Creative Visions. <laughs> and a lot of companies match donations, like big companies, you know? Um, so we have been like finding, we've been asking the most random people, like, you work for Google? They match donations. We're like, We'll rocket reach anyone that is listed under these companies and just blind reach out. Wait, and sorry, how do you, what's the company that helps you make the donations a tax write off? Creative, Creative Visions. Visions. Creative Visions. Have you heard of them, Matt? Uh, I have not, though I, it's not uncommon. I feel like there's a, a handful of companies out there that do it, including um, Brave Maker, um, our buddy uh, Tony G- Gapastioni. Uh, company will and, do a 501c3 so could you do that for like a feature film if i want to make like an indie film i can make it yeah the the trick is though right like uh you know it's a charitable donation so no one's getting a, a kickstarter t-shirt or they're not getting their money back in any way you know it's 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 yeah. a different it's a non-for-profit play basically right which makes complete sense for a pilot presentation right why? Because yeah, we would never make any money off of it, probably. Well, well, because you, even if you sell the show, you would reshoot things, and you know, you wouldn't just repurpose the pilot again, right? Like, you yeah. know, but they do pay you for really small, like, and honestly, not almost never do they ever pay you for the little short the concept. Yeah, for us, we were like, but we want to go to a film festival. They were like, fine, we don't care. <laughs> sure, sure, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So are you guys um, working on and like, is, is this is that kind of your main thing that you're working on right now is kind of. It's pretty consuming right now, um, for sure. But we have we just finished a feature um, that will be we're going to do like a live um, stage reading of that. So that'll be kind of our next thing that we start working on. Yeah. Awesome. I love that. Awesome. Yeah. I, I feel like the trend we're seeing, right, is that like you're just continuing to keep that momentum going, whether it's self shooting something or pitching that like, like Selena, like what you were saying before you're, you've got six burners going at every, every instance, basically. Totally. And I think like we have to, I feel like this is the end of a chapter of our old work 
Like we're starting Mm -hmm. to be done with work that's taken us like three, four years of different production companies. And I mean, Bad Apple, our last proof of concept from start to fit, that was 20, right before 2020 when we shot that and we're just pitching it. Um, Mm -hmm. And of course that's pandemic and stuff and the strike Strike. all happened, but things just take now. I feel like this industry has taken a difficult turn. And part of that is the amount of time you spend on one thing. So it becomes more precious. Like it mm-hmm. used, it used to be, you would come up with a dumb idea. You'd be like, it's like this. You pitch it on your PowerPoint press. Everyone loves PowerPoint. Mm-hmm. They'd be mm-hmm. like, <laughs> yeah. Bill Gates he just texted and said, thank you. <laughs> they would be like, we yes. didn't know if we should keep this alive or not. <laughs> it would take you, it would take you two, three months. Right. And then it would be a yes or a no and you'd move on and it wouldn't hurt so bad because you didn't spend mm-hmm. that much time, you know, your heart and soul. I mean, obviously it's different if you're making an indie movie or something, that's, but at least you, with an indie movie, you have a product at the end. That's like your calling card. Um, mm-hmm, right. You can show someone right now. It's like you've come up with a movie pitch. It's endless notes because everyone has so much time and they're so worried it won't sell because it's such a tough market. And then it's, you know, could be up to a year of packaging. Yeah, the packaging is so it feels so necessary now in this climate. Yeah, yeah, it's part of like we talk about sometimes on the show. Executives like five years ago decided that we we all needed to start using the word undeniable. And now undeniability means a completely packaged and ready to go movie before anyone will say yes to anything. Yeah. yeah. I read in Deadline today that even Greg Berlanti only has six shows on the air right now. He's down from 15. That's bleak. <laughs> That's bleak. I mean, truly, like, listening to your podcast and getting involved in this, in the indie world after we've been in the studio system for so long has been the only thing that's been, like, within our control and very joyous. And uh, we went to Tribeca with Untold Stories during the, uh, during the strike. And we got to meet all these people who are like, yeah, we're just, we're, that are just going without the money. And they're like, we'll get the money. We'll figure it out. And that's kind of what inspired us to just do this. And what is Untold Stories? Is that a project? It's a, it's a program um, where they send five indie filmmakers to Tribeca, the film festival, and you pitch live in front of jurors. And then they give the winner a million dollars to go make their movie. Within the year of premiere at Tribeca. And, yeah. And, and did we you were pitch? one of the fi- yeah, we were one of the five, and we almost didn't get to pitch because it was during the strike, no. and so you weren't allowed to pitch. But thankfully, they worked. They worked with the WGA and worked it out, and we were able to go. We oh, didn't wow. win. We didn't win. And so. or, if you were wondering, I'm sorry. And so, is is this a feature you was... still have though? Right, it's still like one of your pitches. That's yeah, it's it's bot- on your whiteboard. It's bot mitzvah. Um, Amber. Seeley. Oh, it's that one. Yeah, Amber Seeley is currently attached to direct. Oh, great. Oh, cool. We, she's been on the podcast, right? She has been on the podcast. Yeah. She's the best. She's yeah, great. Yeah. Yes. Cool. Well, that's awesome. I was going to ask if you had like any advice for writers, you know, like, like that are trying to get into it. But I mean, it seems, I don't know. I have no advice for anyone at this point. <laughs> um, I mean, what do you- my advice would just be to write. Like there are so many writers that have an idea and they don't actually write, like just continue to write, continue to put work out there. If you want to be a writer, you're in control of your writing. And also right. um, write what you want. Like you're going to hear so much of like, we're looking for a Christmas movie. We're looking for this. And yeah. by the time you write it, no one wa- will want it. So you yeah. might, you Ignore might as well. the mandates. Yeah. yeah. If they're like, we need like a teen sex in the city or something. I mean, come on. Never no, we do every, we do every OWA open writing assignment because those jobs are getting made, but we have learned to just, not do powerpoints for them like don't spend tons of time and just kind of like uh spend maybe one week and go for mm-hmm. it right cool well uh well awesome well thank i mean uh, congrats on all the things it's uh i th- i think what's interesting is that you guys did kind of have this like meteoric rise at a young age and we're in the studio system and now are kind of like hey we should also keep doing that stuff but be making our own 
things it's and crowdfunding like and a, a career yeah. in reverse. Do you know what I mean? Like you're doing the indie like you stuff. You skipped the middle step stuff. and now you're kind of. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically yeah. what you're saying is we peaked in high school and now our careers peaked. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it's like you're just getting momentum to re-peak past. Yeah, the, the yeah, yeah. You, you started nice and high and now you're figuring out how to elevate beyond that. You're like the Bitcoin yeah. price chart. Oh, yeah, God. exactly. Exactly. There you go. That's how yeah. we, honestly, that's how we feel. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really, really depressing ending. Um, well, listen, guys, <laughs> you guys for having us on. Um, thanks so much uh, for not hiring me for, for the first season. Oh, yeah, of sorry. We never talked about that. Yeah, Matt wanted to work <laughs> on your show and you first season rejected him. And so now this is our event. We've yeah. been planning this for <laughs> nine years. <laughs> you guys are so much nicer to Natalie Metzger. <laughs> were we? Not, <laughs> not intentionally. Yeah. Also, yeah. Amy York Rubin directed all of season one. So it would have been a weird thing. Yeah, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't have been season one. It, and Amy's great. It's, uh, truly. I honestly, I don't think that they... Uh, I don't think they showed you guys my stuff. They didn't I, show I us. Imagine. They didn't show us Amy's either. They hired her without telling us. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I just like flopped my interview. <laughs> I think is what happened. Honestly. <laughs> Wait. Can yeah. I? Sorry. I know we're. I know we're supposed to wrap it up, but I just want to ask one last question because, I mean, we're, we are primarily a directing podcast. Like, why? So you guys had directed some episodes of Foursome, and like, obviously. Show rant. like you kind of know everything soup to nuts how a show is made, written, performed. Is there a reason you didn't want to direct your proof of concept yourself? The first one or the first one? Yeah, the uh, first one we didn't yeah. direct because we were acting in it and it felt like too much at the time. We had and directed our. Uh, we have done so. The crowdsourcing campaign is our third proof of concept we've made. The first one we directed ourselves during that third season of foursome and we didn't it wasn't great and we were concerned with putting up mm -hmm. our, this time we were putting up our own money so we were like we need it to be good so that's another thing is you got to believe in yourself right so we didn't and then we realized we could have and on mm -hmm. on this one we're we're going for it we're directing it and also like you're only we have found that with directing, like we've pitched as directors on a couple bigger movies and we have found like you've got, you got to make something every year in order to be in conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I, look, also, I think it's like, it's okay to only want to do one or two jobs. Like you already wrote it and you're acting in it. Worrying about like coverage and scheduling and all that stuff as well. Well, it's going to take you out of like being the best performer you can be. Right. So like, it makes sense to like, you know yeah that was our focus at the time for sure yeah. yeah yeah so you are directing the proof of concept this the new yeah this new one yeah yes, that's okay right. cool as We're, co directors yes always mm -hmm. wearing matching outfits well we'll be wearing our costume we'll, we'll be in costume <laughs> yeah. otherwise yes we would yeah, have been otherwise <laughs> okay good point. when we're not in costume we'll be in matching outfits mm -hmm. <laughs> okay I hope so. I hope so. One time awesome. we yelled action together. It's actually how our directing reel starts. And we were wearing hats and we smashed our hats together <laughs> and really hurt our faces. <laughs> wait, wait, awesome. hold on. Do you say action together every time or that, that was just a bit? No, every yeah, we, no, we did. You say it together. We don't, even, we don't even have to count down. We just, we would just automatically say it together. I like that That's very cool. much. Do you, do you ever like do like, you know, when you when one calls action, also, oftentimes they're putting some intention behind the word, right? Like they're, you know, if it's a quiet, intimate scene, you don't shout it from the top of your lungs or whatever. Do you guys ever? Uh, I've actually never written a quiet scene. Before. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, like, right. remember when I said we had an orgy scene? Yeah, 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 yeah. But you, you, you get what I'm saying. Like, you know, like if it's in a fight or something like that, or if you, you want it to like... be faster or slower, you know, you're kind of leading the performer a little bit when you say action, right? So, so you're like, action, like really quiet so they can't hear you? Uh, I would be like, action. Yeah, for yeah. sure. I, I like, you know, if it's something quiet, I. I'm yeah. not like behind a monitor. I would like run over there, but like, you know, if it's like something really intimate, you don't want to be like action. It right? might, like, you get, 
if you like a a whispered action like asmr at me i would die laughing i would not be able <laughs> to handle it <laughs> well i suppose that answers my question you guys say action the same way we, each time we scream it so loud that because we're usually everyone to- gets a burst of energy because yeah, they're yeah, shocked yeah. They're yeah. Like, why do marissa and selena's scenes always start with like an echoey just like presence at the <laughs> beginning of each yeah, mm. haunting. Yeah, everyone's just yeah. kind of flinches for a second yeah. in fear before the. the yeah. We, yeah. Well, Matt, for what it's worth, I do do what you're describing. Yeah, you I know. mean, I'm not trying to be like sexy or anything, but if it, yeah. if it's a it sad scene, like you are. no, I'll be like, ready, okay, and action. Yeah, <laughs> that was sexy. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> finally, but, a guest has called Oren sexy. Yeah, now we're 432 <laughs> episodes. For, for Step Friend, I think we're going to try that. We're going to be on set with like, I don't know, whoever our dad ends up being. I'll do it for yeah. you, Selena, when you're in your bedroom scene. You're going to be like, action. I'll try, I'll try it out. I'll be like, action. Yeah. <laughs> no, but the, like the point is to not break the scene. It's yeah. to be in the scene. To stay in the moment with but them. You guys are like trying to be funny when you say action so that does go against the no. whole intention oh, okay. of Hot trying tip. to keep the the tone it's right. so funny i've gotten that note that i've been trying to be funny from so many directors so it's really <laughs> really hitting home no i mean we've only directed foursome and our own stuff so we scream it at the same time loudly but maybe if we were doing if we ever got a chance to work on someone else's set we'd be more respectful yeah, if we do a crying scene, we'll whisper it. We'll take okay. your advice. Yeah, I mean, Thank look, do it how you do it. <laughs> I was more just like, or do you ever miss the timing or are you always in sync? Is was the point of the question. <laughs> 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 we are always in sync. Something that's funny is that, like, we'll obviously split duties. Like, Marissa will be dealing with camera, I'll be dealing with actors and vice versa. And one time we had a friend on foursome who we were really far away and there was a ton of extras in the scene and we were doing a bit as we do um people are listening and are like god this set sounds awful uh where we shouted at him he 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 biffed his line he like choked on his uh-huh. line and uh-huh. i was like do it again i like screamed at him i was like do it again you dork or something and all the extras were like this director is an actual monster they were like i can hear everyone <laughs> like I, I heard them talking shit about her. Yeah. <laughs> Did you read our PowerPoint script? Yeah, because the boom operator is just like very intentionally miking their shit talk. <laughs> <laughs> like keeping the channels on. A hundred percent. Yeah. Um, well, cool. On that note, do you guys have a few more minutes to endorse something with us? Unpaid endorsements. So my unpaid endorsement is partially inspired by this conversation. But you guys, I don't know if you've heard the news, but Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet is streaming on Criterion right now. And I unironically fucking love that movie. Like, love that movie. (laughs) Do you think I could show it to my eight-year-old daughter? No, it's too violent. Yeah. She could watch it without you, probably, but it'd be awkward with you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's like a. Was the guns? No, it's a sexually awakening movie. It's like pretty. Yeah, it's pretty steamy. The reason I love that movie is I feel like it was like when I realized what production design was. I was like, oh, this movie is so cool and so heightened. The camera moves are all incredible. The performances are like kind of out of this world. Leo doesn't always understand what he's saying. But, but but the iambic is perfectly pentameter. He's, he's like he's he's so cute and like so like bashful. It works so well. Claire Danes is incredible. Um and then the supporting cast is awesome as well, but like truly the production design is like next level and those camera moves are for real. Um and there's a moment um that I I recognized when I was watching it the other night where there's a transition where Claire Danes notices like reacts to a sound off camera like looks up and then cuts into the next scene like fireworks basically it's the transition from her scene with the nurse to the party scene and it's the sort of transition that like 
like film bros love to talk about like Edgar there's video essays on how great Edgar Wright's film transitions are and stuff right it's all just like invisible and front and center at the same time in that film uh takes so much planning it's it's rad it's really great so that's my endorsement if you've got the Criterion channel uh there's a whole pop Shakespeare lineup this month that I recommend for sure and Criterion channel in general I know it sounds snobby there's a lot of really fun pop stuff on there it's great my unpaid endorsement is for a coffee shop that Selena and I have recently been writing at so Mm. it's called three sisters coffee and tea or tea and coffee it's in Burbank it's on Magnolia and if you're a writer looking for a place that has like unlimited Wi-Fi they're not giving you like a little code that kicks you off after an hour got outlets air conditioning highly recommend mine's a podcast mine's a film Ooh, podcast. Great. Uh, sorry we have a, a rule podcast. I'm just kidding well it's not like well it's about movies not like making movies it's called it's okay we don't hit me. It's called <laughs> <laughs> It's called Cinema Possessed. It's actually a Jack and Corey Bishop's podcast and who Jack directed for some with Justin. And what I love about it is that they Jack is such a movie nerd that he like watches all of the special features on the DVD and will watch the commentary and like walk you through the beginning of how the movie get made and he'll tell you the whole story of the movie which I need because I don't want to see classics or like mm-hmm. anything, anything scary or anything with anxiety. Like I won't watch meet the parents. It'll stress me out. Like I'm very specific on what I want to watch, but I do want to be able to have a conversation about it. So it kind of allows me to participate in conversations and know what the movie is about in a fun, light way without having to watch it. Cinema possessed. Because he possesses physical media. And at the end, he decides whether or not to give it to listeners. Oh, that's fun. Oh, interesting. I thought Possessed makes you think that it's going to be like more of like a horror movie sort of thing. That's his preference. So it definitely also has a double meaning. Chaplin, what you got? I have a really weird, totally unrelated to any of this stuff one. But I've been talking a lot about uh, drawing storyboards recently. And I, I use the app Procreate on the iPad. That is kind of like what everyone uses. But for my last round of storyboards, I had I was... I, I had certain actors that I knew I was going to have that were kind of pre like came with the project. And so I found a bunch of images of like the main guy and I would bring them into procreate and I would just trace his face. Um, and then I was like, Oh, you know, I, in one scene he's like knitting and I was like, Oh, I'll just type in knitting into Google, like, like man's hands knitting into Google and I'll find like an image and I, I just like copy and paste it in procreate and I outline it. And like now I feel like my storyboards are pretty, pretty freaking awesome. I'm just tracing stuff, but I'm kind of like mm. taking elements and just like pasting them on the iPad, just using my stylus or the pencil, Apple pencil to just trace it. And um, I, I don't know, it's, it's kind of I don't know why it's taken me like so long to realize how easy that is. But like an iPad is just like it's just really easy to trace with it because you can just put an image in the app and then just draw the lines. And it's pretty awesome. And my hope is that eventually I don't even need the source image. I've just like learned how to draw this face, you know, cause I've mm-hmm. just done it 50 times. Um, and like, to me, that's my, always my problem with storyboards is like, I think I have, I can draw like the space. Okay. And the framing well, but the faces, they just all look like the same weird dotted eye person. You know, they all just look like the same cartoon character. So anyhow, that's my random tip. If you're trying to draw your own storyboards, like on a tablet, um, like pull in references and just trace them. I don't know. It's pretty, Cool. Anyhow, that's it. Thank you, Marissa and Selena. If we want to find out more about you, what do you? What do we do? do um, we just go to s- just right now. Go step- to Step Friend because we're tagging ourselves and everything anyway. So Step Friend underscore Show on Instagram, um, or you can head to what Oren says is our terrible website www.pitchwithabitch.com. I absolutely did not say it was terrible. I uh, said that him. I give a lot of unsolicited <laughs> advice on people's websites. I can't wait to see yours. Oh, you <laughs> hadn't even seen it yet. Okay. Yeah. No, yeah, no then I Googled you and then I said, oh, pitch with a bitch. That's already an interesting place to start because I would think it would be pitches with bitches. But anyway. <laughs> oh, it's uh, rebranding uh, or hashtag. Yeah. 
<laughs> it's just a little confusing when there's two. I don't know, like a decade uh, building a brand. It's not a big deal to start from scratch. Let's uh, go on to GoDaddy and see if it's available. Um, GoDaddy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it, we'd love to hear from our listeners if you have any thoughts on anything on pitching. You can email us at justshootapod at gmail.com. You can find us across all social media at Just Shoot a Pod. I'm on Instagram at O Kaplan. And I'm at Mr. Matt Enlow across all social media. This episode was edited by Noah Bayshore. Thanks, Noah. And produced by him as well. Along with additional producing by Tyler Small. And you're listening to music provided by the Free Music Archive and the artist Jazar. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.